Yo, what's up? What's up, homies? What's going on? Tonight, we are covering William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Uh, very important book, seminal work here. I'm trying to get myself together. So I hope everybody's having a wonderful and blessed night. Um, and we're going to get this rolling right now. So, yeah. So tonight we're doing uh, Lord of the Flies, William Golding's book. Um, again, as we always do here, um, a lot of people uh, may have read this book. You may have read it in your youth. You may have read it in British literature class. You may have read it in uh, university or grad school. But we're going to be looking at this um, on a little bit deeper level here. So... Uh, we're going to be talking about a number of themes. So I'm not really sure where to start with this book. Um, so I'll just kind of dive into what I um, what I think of it just right off the bat. So first of all, uh, William Golding uh, is an English author, um, lived, what, 1911, I think 1911 to like 93 maybe. Um, the book was published in 1954. And um, he's an English author, of course. He's a... Uh, um, an English establishment author went to uh, Marlborough School in England, um, prep school, which is re reflected in the narrative of the book. And he um, uh, studied Oxford, of course. Um, he's an Oxford man, right? Remember in our Great Gatsby analysis, but he's actually an Oxford man. Um, and the book is amazing. I've read this book. I don't know how many times I've read it. I guess probably seven or eight times. I reread it again uh, last night and um, today. And it's, I was really, um, I'm not really sure uh, how to just, how to say this, but I was really, um, struck by the book this time more than any other book. Maybe, maybe except for the first time that I read the book. Um, the first time that I read, I remember the first time I read the book, I was in second grade and this is my copy. This is my copy from second grade. Um, I went to my dad, um, my dad uh, took me and my sister to the mall, and I remember going to, um, there was a uh, Books a Million, but it wasn't like the the big, you know, warehouse Books a Million like like it is now. It was inside the mall, and it was like a small bookstore. And, um, and my dad said that I could buy two books, so I bought a, like a Batman, um, like sort of novelization book. Not like a graphic novel, but like a Batman book, and I bought this one. Um, and, um, I, 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 I don't know why I bought it. I guess maybe because I'd seen, um, the, the ad for the movie that came out. There's a movie that came out in 1990. And so anyway, so, so I read the Batman book first, of course. Uh, and then I read, um, Lord of the Flies and this book, uh, really affected me. Um, it really affected me in, in life. Um, because as a young, you know, as a young lad, um, this had like, this is one of the levels of the book. This book had like everything that was cool, you know, as a young boy, um, it, it's, it, it's adventure. It's a de you know, it's a desert Island book. I've always loved desert Island books. Um, I always loved Robinson Crusoe. So I like that theme. It's, um, kind of an end of the world book. It's a survival book, but most of all, it's a book about, um, basically on, especially on the surface, it's a bunch of prep school boys, uh, like, like myself, like I was, um, who get marooned on an Island and they have to survive. And they, um, sort of, they, they split into two camps. And I always thought that the Jack camp was super cool. Um, which is like the hunters. And I always wanted to be, um, one of those. And then like, I mean, this is like, you know, this is like little kids, like playing war when they're young. Right. Now that, that affected me greatly. Um, I read the book again. Um, I think we had to read it in like fourth grade. So I reread it again. Then I read it again. Yes, Kristen, we do need a based intro. We need some based, we need some based, uh, we need some based breathalyzer music here, folks. Um, so, you know, if you make, um, uh, amazing, uh, badass dystopian synth wave that fits our theme, you know, send me a DM or send me an email. Um, and, uh, let me know if you want to, um, if you want to uh, add some intro music to our stream here and I'm going to say my email, I'm not going to put it in the stream, um, but I'm going to say it. It's mad maximalism at Gmail, M A D M A X X 
I am A L I S M mad maximalism with two X's at gmail.com. So email me or, you know, drop me some, I got a couple of emails, some really nice emails um, of support and people asking me questions and things like that. So I really appreciate that. Um, and, or just um, DM me um, on Instagram. So um, yeah. So, so anyway, so I, I really like, I was really affected by this. I love the ideas of, especially when I was young, I was the age of the boys in the book. So I thought it was like, you know, it's survival, war, painting your faces, sharpening spears, um, surviving. And I thought that that was amazing. I reread it a few times um, in school. And then um, I, I think I read it. I read it as part of a, uh, I read it in British literature, um, again, in like 10th grade. And then I read it again um, in uh, like my second year of university. Um and then, I don't know, a couple more times. And then I've seen the movie, like, I don't know, do- dozens of times. Um, again, it's a 1990 movie. We're not analyzing the movie here as part of this, but the movie is interesting on its own. It's There are two movie versions. One is like 1963 or something, and that's directed by, um, is it Peter Brook? Um, yeah, I think it's Peter Brook. Peter Brook is the great uh, English theater theorist, and he wrote the book... Um, the Empty Space. It's like an avant-garde book. I think it's Peter Brook uh, that did the first movie. And then, and that, that's a black and white film. And then the second one is 1990. And that one stars Balthazar Getty, the Getty family. Um, speaking of the Gettys, um, here's a, this just happens to be sitting right next to me. If you want to know anything about the Gettys, there was that terrible movie, The Richest Man in the World, that came out. Remember that um, the Creeper was in it. And then they had to get rid of him and reshoot all the scenes with Christopher Plummer, but this is a great book on the Gettys. Um, if you're interested, John Paul Getty, and then of course Getty the second, and then Getty the third is the one who was um, K I D N A P P E D and was probably a I don't know so- something about monarch or gladio. Um, but Balthazar Getty is one of them, and he plays the protagonist in the film. But we're not going to analyze the film. Um, this is just about the just about the book. So. Uh, but it's interesting that Balthazar Getty is the protagonist of the book. Oh, the book, the movie actually also stars um, James Badge Dale. You may not know who that is, but he's like a, he's a good character actor. And he's in, now he's in a bunch of like uh, MIC um, movies. Like, I think he's in 13 Hours, that, you know, total, that propaganda about um, we came, we saw, he died, right? About that event, the big, the big nine event 10 years later in Libya. Remember that? He's also the guy who is, he plays a kind of a deus ex machina character at the end of The Departed. Remember, he's the guy who um, shoots Leo when he opens the elevator. Deus ex machina is is an interesting correlation because that plays a huge role in Lord of the Flies. That's one of the um, major uh, integral parts of the book. So I guess we'll dive into um, the book. Oh yeah, I didn't... I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but I didn't really mention um, what I, uh, what the reason that I was really mo- not moved, but I guess disturbed by the book this time, um, because uh, the book is the book is so disturbing, especially when you read it as an adult. Um, it's really disturbing. It's got so many elements of. It's so dark. It's a really dark dark book. I mean, I, I don't, I know I'm not going to convey like how I was affected by the book reading it this time, but it, it's, it, it's really, it's so profound. Um, and I had a really not difficult time, uh, but I, I spent a lot of time, even though I just reread it again, um, uh, last night and today, but I feel like I've spent a lot of mental time, um, sort of trying to process the profundity of this novel. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely dark and the themes are relevant and complex and kind of hard to parse out. Um, let's see. Oh, TGF said, uh, check. Okay. Let me check real quick. Um, Hey, shout out to everybody who's here. Really appreciate you. All my homies. Ho snap. Wow. Oh man. TGF. You guys, TGF sends. Uh, I'm trying not to. TGF sent me a uh, sent me a, a really big, um, really big uh, donation there. And TGF with 
$150 of support. Wow. Oh, that's big time. Listen, um, you guys, um, I want to thank everybody who's supported me. Um, I want to thank everybody who supported me. Uh, a lot of people have supported me um, and have been really, you guys have been really amazing. And if you, of course, if you noticed, you know, that shout out to, shout out to our, our homeboy DPH, Church of the Eternal Logos, who um, supported us big time. I mean, flew the banner, get, you know, we did an interview with him um, a couple days ago and he was really um, big time in, um, and jump, make the channel jump up. I really appreciate it. Of course, shout out to um, JD, Jay's analysis, who shared our stream on a, a couple of different platforms. We really appreciate that. But listen, Nick at the Green Feathers, um, homeboy, I love you. I appreciate you. That 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 gets me right here, you guys. Um, that's that's a lot. I can't tell you how much that means to me. Um, and that that really brother, I love you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. I, 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 I don't know what I would do without you guys. And Nick, thank you. Thank you so much. Really from the bottom of my heart. That really, that really means a lot. Thank you for your extremely generous donation. Um, you guys, um, if you're watching this now, especially if you're watching this later, um, check out and, and you, and you don't know the green feathers, um, um, YouTube channel, please check him out. Please, um, subscribe to his channel, check out his interviews with all of our, our wonderful and based homies. Um, and yes, TGF, Nick, you've been a, you're such a supporter of everybody um, in our community. And wow, you, that really means a lot to me. So thank you so much. I really do. I love you and I appreciate you. I love, and I love all you guys. Thank you so much for being here. You really helped the channel grow and you guys, we're going to keep growing. Yes. Thank you to Jeff. Of course. Thank you to Jeff, my homeboy. I love you. Thank you to beautiful Ellie. Of course. Thank you so much. I love you, homegirl. Um, thank you to Crispy, Thomas Henderson, Jerry, Mixkey, um, David Patrick Harry, JD, Rachel Wilson, A Devotional Heart, Kristen at Slow Boy Whiteboard. Thank you to all our homies, um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. All right, so let's let's sort of dive into this novel, you guys. So first of all, um, Lord of the Flies, <laughs> with a biographical and critical note by E.L. Epstein, <laughs> LOL. Um, see, check out our, our Jay Gatsby, um, is Jeff Stein Effrey, um, stream that we just did, uh, which I think was pretty fun, but let's look at Lord of the Flies. Um, so just, uh, I've already started scarring up the book here at the beginning. Um, and I, and I used this copy because I didn't want to mess up my old second grade copy. And I've got like four copies of this book here. So um, I just chose this one as the cheap, cheap one to mark up. So um, first of all, the, let's go with, um, let me discuss like, I guess what is my thesis um, in terms of our analysis of this book? Um, and I would say that, I, again, I really had um, a lot to think about with this book. I mean, there's so many themes. Let me go through some of the themes in this book and then I'll tell you um, what I think of this book. First of all, um, we get obviously William Blake's innocence versus experience plays a huge role in this. We've covered William Blake. We've talked a bit about his songs of innocence and experience, right? We talked about the, um, the lamb and the tiger, 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 burning bright in the forests of the night. Uh, what immortal hand or eye could frame that fearful symmetry, right? When the stars threw down their spears, um, we did, that's, that plays a major role in this book, obviously, with the ideas of innocence and experience, um, which we're going to get to. Another is, I guess, isolation isolation and solitude. We have um, sort of a weird dichotomy between the archetypal and the ideogrammatic in this book. Um, and we'll, we're going to read a little bit of a critical analysis essay that deals with signs and symbols um, in terms of the novel. The, um, the triumvirate, the... Roman uh, triumvirate, right, with um, uh, uh, Caesar, Pompey, and uh, Crassus, and then later um, with uh, uh, Mark Antony, Lepidus, and Octavian. And now we sort of get this weird triumvirate of Ralph, Jack, and Simon, who are the three main characters in the book. Piggy is, of course... Um, one of the other central characters, but he's not one of the protagonists per se. And then of course there's Roger, who's one of the villains. Um, there are, there's a, 
a, a strange cast of characters. And um, of course, there are no women in the book. It's just uh, these lads on the island. Um, and then there are a couple of other characters who who play a role, which we'll get to. Um, uh, uh, Eden, um, the, the book is Edenic. It's a, it's sort of, I, this ties into my thesis that the book is a, is a kind of quasi Neo Eden. It's like a Neo Edenic Genesis, um, in a, I don't know if it's a, you know, post technocratic, post transhuman, post nuclear Eden, but that's kind of where I'm going with this. Um, the Deus Ex Machina, the occult plays a huge overriding role in this, in terms of um, the narrative of the book. It's literal and figurative. The title of the book is Lord of the Flies. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Plato's Cave, which kind of morphs into uh, Simon's Cave. Uh, the Disciple Simon um, plays a big role in this. We also have... Uh, we have so many biblical allusions in this book and we have sort of vampirical images. We have the pastoral, we've got, um, we've even got like kind of a, kind of, uh, an alpha, like an alpha Chad, uh, you know, a Venezuelan, um, Tristan idea versus a sort of Passio beta, um, Passio Bega Vedan bug eating uh, uh, dichotomy in the book, which is pretty, which is pretty interesting. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm going to start by. Why don't I start by just reading? So one thing. Okay, so let's talk about the, the. Let's talk about the construction of the book. We also we always talk about form and content, um, in terms of the structure and the. The um, the subtext and the worldview expressed in the book and in, in any book that we read, any poem, any work of literature. And this one is um, Golding. So, so we'll, okay. So William Golding is often forgotten as a Nobel Prize laureate, as a Nobel laureate, right? Um, Nobel Prize. By the way, um, you may not know this and forgive me because I'm speaking to a high IQ audience, but if, if you don't know this, first of all, just to make sure everyone knows this, um, it is the Nobel Prize. It's not the Nobel Prize. Um, and that's okay. It's okay if you didn't know that. And also, when someone is a Nobel Prize winner, they can be a Nobel Prize winner. You can win the Nobel Prize for literature. You can win the Nobel Peace Prize. You can win the Nobel Prize for economics, physics, etc. cetera. Um, so it's not just like one Nobel Prize. Now, of course, the Nobel Prize is a, like we've mentioned before, is a total globalist probably money laundering, you know, culture creation operation. But that being said, William Golding is often forgotten as one of the Nobel laureates. There are only a few um, Nobel Prize for Literature laureates uh, in English literature or in, in Anglo-American literature. We've covered T.S. Eliot. Um, there's William Golding. There's Ernest Hemingway, who we sort of covered. John Steinbeck actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature, which was a a weird one. Even pe people even thought that back then. Um, Eugene O'Neill, of course, long day's journey in the night. Um, who else? Uh, let's see. Oh, our boy, Seamus Heaney, right? 1995 Nobel prize for literature from Northern Ireland, Queens university. Shout out to Queens. Um, let's see a few years ago, um, the South African, um, J Jam could say a one. Um, he wrote the book foe and disgrace. Um, shouts out to South Africa, shouts out to beautiful Eliana out there and all of our South African homies who may be watching this. <laughs> um, so William Golding is often forgotten as a Nobel prize winner, but he did win the Nobel prize for literature. Of course he didn't win. You don't really win it for a specific book. You win it for a, a body of literature and he won. He didn't win for Lord of the flies. Lord of the flies was his first book. Um, but he's got rite of passage in a, a bunch of other books. Um, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And going back, it's interesting to reread this because, again, like with my own experience and story of this book, it works both on a second grade um, lads adventure story level and also definitely on a um, based, red-pilled adult level um, and in a completely different way. Both are valid interpretations and valid ways of looking at the work, of course, because it's in the canon of literature. It's a great work. 
Uh, Smiling Conqueror is South African. Shouts out to you, Smiling Conqueror, and all our South African homies. Um, so let's look at the oh, what I was going to say about the construction before I went and got on my little tangent there on my little train is that if if anything, um, this book is beautifully written, especially uh, in terms of its first sentences. And it's opening paragraphs of the chapters. Um, the chat, you know, I can't think right now of a better work of prose in terms of the opening of each chapter. Um, the opening paragraphs are really amazing. They they really outdo actually sort of the rest, a lot of the body of the work. Now that's purposeful because the book is written specifically in terms of its diction um, and its narrative structure to mimic both a you know, a third person omniscient narrator, which plays into the content in terms of the way that the island is alive that they're on and that they feel like they're being watched. But also it plays into the idea of that these are kids and we're looking at it from their point of view. Remember James Joyce, shout out to our homie Crispy. Um, James Joyce did this beautifully. He's he's the probably the innovator of this in terms of instead of writing a story, um, up where the, the speaker is young, like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or, you know, once upon a time, but then using the high diction of looking back. Um, uh, the Portrait of the Arts as a Young Man, remember, opens with the passage about the, um, I was young and the moo cow, and the diction mirrors the content. So in other words, if you're going to tell the story in the first person, from a first person point of view about being a young child, then you want to speak in the appropriate diction that applies to that, which would be the thought processes of however young you are, right? Now, this is, again, the third-person narrator, so it doesn't really play into that, but in terms of the rest of the narrative structure and the chapters, it does. So um, let's let's just start with the opening of the first chapter, and then I'm going to get to the, to an essay um, about this book. It's called The first chapter is called The Sound of the Shell. The boy with fair hair lowered himself down the last few feet of rock and began to pick his way toward the lagoon. Though he had taken off his school sweater and trailed it now from one hand, his gray shirt stuck to him and his hair was plastered to his forehead. All around him, the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bath of heat. He was clamoring heavily among the creepers and broken trunks when a bird, a vision of red and yellow, flashed upwards with a witch-like cry, and the cry was echoed by another. Hi, it said, wait a minute. The undergrowth at the side of the scar was shaken and a multitude of raindrops fell pattering. Wait a minute, the voice jerked. I got up. The fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem for a moment like the home counties. Okay, now that may seem so straightforward and easy to you, um, and it is purposefully, but there's something you need to consider, which is the fact that this, this, is so well, the opening paragraph of this book is really blew me away rereading it. It's so well constructed. Again, it's the idea of this, this conveys the word, the, the, the true wordsmith, wordsmiths, um, show versus tell versus tell, uh, MO, which is the sense that He's not telling us anything. He's showing us everything we need to know about what's going to happen in the story is in that first paragraph. We know that he's young and we see him the way that we see him, that, that, that it begins in media res. It begins completely in the middle of the, of the action. We don't know what's just happened. We're going to infer what's just happened in a second. But we, we know that he's young because not he doesn't need to tell us he's young or how old he is or any stuff. But the fact that we see him in this school uniform and he's he's dragging, he's trailing his jacket behind him in the water is like this perfect childlike image that you can you can think back to being a child and you can imagine this, right? Um, we get the image of the plane crash. There's a plane crash. Okay, so what we know is, um, let's see, um, we know that uh, the the story begins with a kind of, in a way, a kind of deus ex machina because the boys, or this boy right now is just one, they are delivered to this island out of the sky, right? Now we're going to see how that's mirrored at the end of the novel because 
their deliverance is back up into the sky, right? Um, and again, there's a deliverer from the sky at the end of the novel. A, li- a, a li- you know, well, we'll get to that. Um, but we know that let's get let's move it. Let's let's keep going here. The owner of the voice came back backing out of the undergrowth, and that twig scratched on a greasy windbreaker. The naked crooks of his knees were plump, caught, and scratched by thorns. He bent down, removed the thorns carefully, and turned around. He was shorter than the fair boy and very fat. <laughs> he came. That's a perfect description for the age. It's age appropriate, right? In terms of the speaker. Um, he came forward, searching out safe lodgements for his feet, and then looked up through thick spectacles. Where's the man with the megaphone? The fair boy shook his head. This is an island. I think, at least I think it's an island. Uh oh, dogs barking. It's a reef out in the sea. Perhaps there aren't any grown ups anywhere. The fat boy looked startled, but there was that pilot, but he wasn't in the passenger cabin. He was up in front. The fair boy was peering at the reef through screwed up eyes. All them other kids, the fat boy went on. Some of them must have got out. They must have, mustn't they? Um, aren't there any grown ups at all? I don't think so. The fair boy said this solemnly, but then the delight of a realized ambition overcame him. In the middle of the scar, he stood on his head and grinned at the reversed fat boy. No grown-ups. So they are they are on an island, right? They're they're on a desert island with no adults. And how you know how much how much of like a uh, you know, if you're a kid, how awesome is this is like a, a Peter Pan life where they there's no rules. Now we're gonna see how that degenerates in the rest of the novel. But notice some of the images here. First of all, um, we have the scar. And the way that the speaker describes the scar going into the island. So first of all, we know that nature has been violated, right? There is a scar going into a pristine wilderness, a pristine jungle atmosphere. We have a plane crash with fire. We have some of the kids are dead, right? But they don't realize it because they're in this state of innocence. We, they, it doesn't mean anything per se to them yet, right? We have wreckage. We have blood and violence. We also have the main character who stands on his head. He he inverts himself to look at this other character. We also have uh, an immediate social hierarchy. We have, for now, an alpha and a beta, right? Piggy's obviously the beta. Ralph is remains the alpha throughout the story, but it's strange because we have this triumvirate. Now, we're going to see that there is a literal power structure and the uh, power uh, struggle in the rest of the book. We have the alpha and the beta fight. We have Ralph and Jack, but there's no real, there is a clear alpha and a beta. We do have survivors, but there's another character thrown in. Okay. And that's, that's going to be um, 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 Simon. And we also have, we have Piggy who is going to be the brains. Obviously he's this little fat kid with glasses and his glasses are going to provide the Promethean fire, which is then going to burn up the island um, through misuse and through, through one could say, both Jack's diabolical nature and the diabolical thing that is living on the island. Um, or at least it's present. Yo, we got to open up this bang right here. We're going to open up this bang. Why did I get this one? Because shout out to Ultra Coke Q10, right? We got to support our boy, Kang AJ. So I thought I'd get a Coke Q10 bang to drink here. Wow, that's really good, you guys. I can taste the Coke Q10. Tastes like Austin. Speaking of boars... You know, one time I was hunting on a boar track with my AR uh, right near where, where my ex-wife lived uh, out there in the canyon. I got to tell you, I came across a wild boar on the on the track and her eyes just happened to lock for a minute and he sensed my alpha power. He turned around and I knew that it was because I was the dominant figure in this nature scheme. You know, I remember being two years old and my granddaddy was telling me about cyborgs and human animal pig chimeras. So I recalled that story in my mind palace. I'm not bragging, folks. I'm just telling you how it is on a weekend here. All right. So let's keep going. Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah, thank you for putting up with me. (laughs) So um, let's see. We've established a hierarchy and a dichotomy. 
Um, <laughs> there's uh, let's see. My auntie told me not to run on account of my on account of my asthma. These are English school kids, and of course, um, of course, Ralph responds asthma. So he people, I think the popular conception of this book, if there is one, is that Ralph and Piggy are friends. They're not really, they're more allies and they sort of use each other. We're going to talk about the uh, esoteric symbolism of that later on. Um, But just like with Nick and Gatsby, that just because the two are sort of in this thing together doesn't make them friends. Um, Ralph is pretty stern with Piggy. Um, Let's see. um, Moving on here. Um, okay, so I want to read this paragraph that describes the, the island. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or recl- reclined against the light and their green their green feathers. Their green feathers, right? Shouts out to our homeboy, green feathers. Wow, synchro, you guys. That's total synchro. We're all one, man, in this book. No, shouts out to our homie, the green feathers, who appeared, right, in the narrative. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. The beach between the palm terrace and the water was a thin stick, endless apparently, for to Ralph's left, the perspective of palm and beach and water drew to a point at infinity and always almost visible was the heat. He undid the snake clasp of his belt um, let's see. He's 12 with bright, excited eyes. He has the, he's like a boxer. He wiped his glasses and adjusted. This is piggy. Now adjust them on his button. The frame had made a deep pink V on the bridge right now. One may think, okay, what's the esoteric symbolism of the V there? Are we talking about V for victory? Which of course, Alistair Crowley claimed as a magic, um, sign that he gave to Winston Churchill. He really did say that by the way. Um, and actually, that's that may not be out of the realm of possibility. Um, but here, of course, we're supposed to think of the pink V marked on Piggy's face. This is an obvious innuendo, right? Um, for it's marking out who Piggy is in terms of his beta nature, beta character here. Um, he says, they used to call me. Oh, oh, he says, I don't care what they call me, he said confidentially, so long as they don't call me what they used to call me at school. Ralph was faintly interested and he says, basically, what's that? And he says, they used to call me piggy. Ralph shrieks with laughter. He jumps up, piggy, piggy, piggy says, no, don't call me that. And then Ralph goes into a fighter plane stance and starts playing like a little kid. Like he's like, you know, he's mimicking basically what he had just seen um, prior to the start of the narrative. And it says piggy grinned reluctantly, pleased despite himself at even this much recognition. In other words, any recognition for him is, uh, any recognition, no matter how bad the recognition, um, is good recognition to him. Um, uh, let's see. The beach was interrupted abruptly by the square motif of the landscape. Ralph hauled himself into his platform, noted the coolness and shade, and shut one eye. Um, he looks. He picked his way up to the seaward edge of his platform and stood looking down into the water. It was clear to the bottom and bright with the, uh, let's see, I marked through this word, so I'm trying to read it. Um, efflorescence or of tropical weed and coral. Uh, let's see. Beyond the platform, there was more enchantment. Here we go. Some act of God, a typhoon perhaps, or the storm that had accompanied his own arrival had banked sand inside the lagoon so that there was a long, deep pool in the beach with a high ledge of pink granite at the further end. Ralph had been deceived before now by the specious appearance of depth in a beach pool, and he approached this one preparing to be disappointed, but the island ran true to form, and the incredible pool, which clearly was only invaded by the sea at high tide, was so deep at one end as to be dark green. The idea of green, just like in The Great Gatsby, plays a prominent role in this. Um, In this book, it tends to be more associated with envy. The green, the war... um, Except for, by the way, when uh, when Simon is um, not sacrificed in the book, um, he is he is murdered in the book, 
and he's carrying a green light. The water was warmer than his blood. The warm the water was warmer than his blood, and he might have been swimming in a huge bath. Piggy appeared again, sat on the ledge, and watched Ralph's green and white body enviously. Right there, you go. Um, let's see. Um, Ralph did a surface dive and swam underwater with his eyes open. The sandy edge of the pool loomed up like a hillside. He turned over, holding his nose, and a golden light danced and shattered over his face. Piggy was looking determined and began to take off. Uh, began to uh, take off his shirt. Then he got, they went swimming. Um, he, Piggy can't swim, but Ralph says I could swim when I was five. Daddy taught me he's a commander in the Navy. And then Piggy says that his daddy is dead. Um, so we have, that leads me into my thesis for this novel. Um, and, and, um, I'm going to go into that before I read uh, this little, a uh, little bit of this, um, essay. And my, my, basically my thesis for this novel, I tried, I, there are so many different paradigms of, in terms of analysis for this book. And that's one of the things that's mentioned in the, in the, uh, academic analysis that we're going to read a formal analysis. Um, you know, are we going to look at this along the lines of, is this another, is this another Gnostic tale, right? Is this a Gnostic quest? Um, is this a, is this a um, Christian allegory? Is it a, um, a metaphor for, um, I don't know, man versus nature, right? Or some kind of bullshit, which is obviously not, you, you could read it that way, but obviously it's not, it, we don't care about that. Um, cause it, it's not, it's not true in terms of its analysis. Right. Um, I would say that what I figured out and this Jay kind of led me I was, cause I was thinking about this last night. Um, if you do, if you checked out, um, Jay's show last night at Jay's analysis, of course, um, he was showing some of our homegirl here, um, uh, slow boy, whiteboard, Kristen's videos. And you remember when he said, um, that he had that breakthrough when he was driving through, um, Wyoming on the way, or was he in Wyoming? He was driving, he was driving out West and he was driving to Montana last summer and they drove past the reservations. Right. And he realized that we, you know, we are on the reservation. That's the, the, the metaphor that, but you know, it's true, right. In terms of, you know, in terms of where we find ourselves now in geopolitics and society. Well, I realized that this afternoon after I read this book and I kept thinking about what is this, right? Because, because the, in terms of reading it, like allegorically, it doesn't, it doesn't really hold all the way true. It sort of, it, it, skew, it, it gets skewed, skewed a bit. Um, and I was thinking, is this, is this, it's not as simple as it, as it says on its surface, there's, there's some profound thing that's lurking just like the beastie in the book. There's a profound, um, there's a profound specter that's lurking, uh, within the narrative of this book in the tropical wilderness, kind of like, you know, the Leviathan is lurking in Moby Dick, um, or, or Ahab lurks under the, uh, um, in the, in the cabins of the ship, right. In the bowels of the ship and Moby Dick. But what I realized is that, um, uh, that it's not that we are the Island. It's not that we, the reader are on the Island. Um, it's that they are the Island. They're on the Island and we are not, we're elsewhere. And this book is almost like a test case or a microcosm of the, this is like if the Anglo-American establishment took a bunch of, um, let's say, Kathy O'Brien, 11 Stranger Things monarch figures that are the children of them, which they often do. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, Jim Morrison and, the son of Admiral Morrison and the Tonkin Gulf of Tonkin incident and all, all that kind of stuff. Right. They're at an, they're at an elite English prep school and they take them and they put them on an Island. And this is what happens, right? We're going to see what happens. We're going to see what hierarchies develop. 
We're going to see where they take it. But I don't mean that just literally because that could be one, one way to look at this. What I mean is this is a microcosm for the fact that they are the, the island is the new Eden. This is the post-apocalyptic Eden that they want, right? Um, we know that they, you know, we talk about Depop and we talk about um, ultimate goals and we talk about the pyramid structure and the, the, the cap of the pyramid. And we're going to see how that plays into this literally in the book, because they're going to say, I'll just say now that at, there's a scene in the book where they describe how everything that they make is in a triangle shape. Now, obviously that's the triumvirate, but they make them in pyramids. They make everything in a pyramid shape. And even when they, when they decide where to sit, when the leaders are deciding where to sit and they form a, a kind of a parliament, right? That first they try this kind of like they, there's this struggle between like an authoritarian system and a, and a parliament or a democracy. And then it becomes a hybrid of both where it really doesn't matter which one it is because they form a pyramid and the cap of the pyramid is specifically empty. And because we have Beelzebub lurking in the jungle and the jungle is the jungle of the mind and of the unknown. And it's their new Eden. They immediately, by the way, they violate their Eden. Um, they want their own little new neo Gnostic, um, you know, post-apocalyptic post nuke world They're The nukes are just, I'm not just making that up. Uh, Piggy specifically mentions nuclear warfare and Golding actually, um, uh, excised great, huge swaths of of the narrative that were about the nuclear war that takes place outside of the book that plays a a beast role for the book, and they um, they proceed in the book to develop hierarchies where they all of them are part of the power structure and none of them are us, and I think that's the difficult thing to understand about this book is that usually we see these books as like, okay, that's them and that's this person and their archetypes and we are the lowest part, but that's not the way it is in this book. We're actually none of these people. Now we relate to them because they're, they're human beings in the book, but you discover that even the youngest ones, and it's interesting because the idea of like, you know, in, in, in infantilizing society and talking to, you know, society like children, right? Google, right? Uh, um, Google, right? Says Sam Hyde. All, all of the platforms are in these like two syllable goo goo gaga terms. Um, and with that, we realize that they also are part of that and they have their own structure to figure out. But they, it, it's what they do with it. And even though they proceed to destroy their world, they violate their, their, their new Eden. They burn, they kill, they destroy, they steal, they use each other. And then at the end, they are taken right back out of it and they're all safe. They're all safe. Now, some of them die, of course, because there are always casualties, even within their own, their own paradigm and their own system. Yes. Um, but they escape at the end. So with that being said, that's, that's, that's what I, that's was my realization about Lord of the flies, because I, I, I was, I had a hard time with coming up with who does the Lord of the flies represent in this book? Who is Beelzebub? I mean, besides obviously Beelzebub in the book is Beelzebub. Um, but, but who represents whom and whom? And, we're going to look at, I'm going to look at this, some bits of some critical analysis, uh, analysis of this book and discuss um, what these things mean. Um, and because I found some interesting, some interesting ideas. So first of all, of course, um, I want to look at. Harold Bloom, Harold Bloom's introduction um, to his own collection of critical analysis um, about this particular book. And there's a few different scholars that I'm going to cite here, but I'm just going to uh, start with Harold Bloom. So he says, 
popular as it continues to be, Lord of the Flies essentially is a period piece. Published in 1954, it is haunted by William Golding's service in the Royal Navy during the Second World War. The hazards of the endless battles of the North Atlantic against German submarines culminated in Golding's participation in D-Day, the Normandy invasion of June 6, 1944. Wow, Golding was in D-Day. That's pretty wild. Though Lord of the Flies is a moral parable in the form of a boy's adventure story, in a deeper sense, it is a war story. The book's central emblem is the dead parachute is mistaken for, by the boys for the beast Beelzebub, diabolic Lord of the Flies. Um, for Golding, the true shape of Beelzebub is a pig's head on a stick, and the horror of war is transmuted into the moral brutality implicit in his view in most of us. The dead parachutist in Golding's own interpretation represents history. Now, I disagree with this part, but then he says, Golding's overt intention has some authority, but not perhaps enough to warrant our acceptance of so simplistic a symbol. In other words, Golding himself, and what, what Bloom is saying here about Golding is that uh, William Golding said, oh, the book is about the horror in all of us, right? We're, we're, all, we're, all around, we're all like the kids in this story. But Harold Bloom is saying, uh, it's a little too simplistic. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say we are none of them. Now, we are going to identify with the story because we can relate, because we're human beings, and we can place ourselves there. But we're, we're not the people in this book. He says, judging Lord of the Flies, a period piece means that one, double, uh, one doubts its long-range survival if only because it is scarcely a profound vision of evil. Um, Golding's first, uh, let's see, he talks about the darkness visible, uh, free fall, his book, darkness visible, by the way, which is of course a reference to, <clears throat> excuse me, a reference to paradise lost. Go back to my Milton paradise lost stream, right? We analyzed paradise lost and we talked about, um, the dark was so dark that, uh, it was darkness visible, right? When Satan gets to hell. And of course one always, I mean, that's become, that is a, that is a, continuing motif in the literature that we analyze because we see um, these kids in a, what you would assume to be, becomes a paradise lost, right? They're in a paradise. They're on a, a tropical island, but once they violate the, uh, the, the book is interesting because it's violated from the beginning. Like I mentioned, the scar going into the land from the burning plane crash, right? Which is a kind of a, I don't know, a, a fall of Icarus, right, into into the, the sea and the land um, represents a violation at the beginning of the narrative. Um, it's also a an overwhelming violation of the innocence that's going to occur later in the book. And the the really powerful part of the book for me was actually that the very end is incredibly powerful um, in this book. And it it's powerful sort of in a like in a quasi Orwellian sense, you know, if you know, 1984, you know, well, we've covered animal farm here, of course, but if you've read, um, 1984, you know, the final, um, chapter in the final few pages of, the, of 1984. And it's, it's kind of the opposite of that because the characters are delivered, but it's also worse. Um, and I'll get to that. Okay. So, um, let's see. Uh, he says, man is a fallen being. He is gripped by original sin. This is Harold Bloom saying this. His nature is sinful and his state perilous. I accept the theology and admit the triteness, but what is trite is true. And a truism can become more than a truism when it is a belief passionately held. And Harold, that was actually William Golding. But but Blake said, I mean, uh, Bloom says, passion is hardly a standard of measurement in regard to truth. Lord of the Flies aspires to be a universal fable but its appeal to American school children partly in, in hears in its curious exoticism. Now I disagree with that again. Um, I don't disagree with the, on one sense, the validity of Bloom's um, analysis of the meaning of this book in terms of its fable idea. But one thing, and the reason I don't disagree with that is because it's a, it's a story. It's a, it's a children's story. And, on the surface, one is supposed to take an obvious moral from this book, which is, you know, um, this is what happens when kids go on it, you know, unsupervised by adults, right? That would be like the kind of like easy fable, um, Aesop-ish moral to take from the book. 
But as we've said from the very beginning of this channel, it's a mistake to assume that the great works of literature have a moral in terms of that they have some lesson to be learned, right? They're not, they're not fables. When you read verse, especially when you read poems, poetry is not a mystery to be solved. It's not a fable. It doesn't have a moral. Sometimes it just is, but it always has a particular purpose or worldview inherent, um, inherent in it, right? Um, in the construction of the work. They always do that. We talked about, we talked about how in, in, in DBH stream, how, how literature, great literature, great art, um, always has really a dual purpose, right? To explore why we're here, our relationship, like, right? Our relationship with God. Why are we here? What are we doing here? And then to our, our relationship, uh, with each other, right? Who, who are we and what are we doing? And I think that, um, it's a mistake to try to pull it to, to try to pull a moral from this, this book. However, um, because that, and that's because the complexities of it are a lot more, um, a cutting than your normal novel. And we often find that with, um, children's literature. I mean, anybody, um, you know, if you've ever read, um, Peter Pan, or if you've read, uh, the wizard of Oz, if you've read um, the sword of the stone, you read any of these books, a lot of times, you know, they're written for children, but, but they're actually the, the, the complexities are, are far more profound and the archetypes are deeper, um, especially going back and reading them um, as adults. That's the reason that they survive y'all. That's the reason that these works live, right? Otherwise they're just, they're just, you know, uh, trite little, um, kids books or whatever. Right. Um, I know I'm, I'm, I'm driving Kristen probably crazy cause I light my cigarette and then I sit there and I, and I babble on for so long. Um, and then I don't, and then it goes out. So apologies <laughs> out there. If that's giving you anxiety watching that. Right. So, all right, let's keep going here. Um, this is from Kay Shelapon's uh, vision and structure in Lord of the flies, a semiotic approach, wanker title, but whatever. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, let's see. It was Frank Kermode who said that Golding's novels are simple insofar as they deal in the primordial patterns of human experience and insofar as they have skeletons of parable. On these simple bones, the flesh of narrative can take extremely complex forms. That's my one, by the way, if, that's my one, my probably my one allowance for the word extremely or for adverbs in writing if you're a writer. I'm not offering advice, obviously. I hate advice. Um, but I would say in terms of in terms of integrity um and structure and writing and um uh I don't know, uniformity and um trying to produce adverbs, avoid words like extremely, because the flesh of narrative can take complex forms is already complex. You don't need the right. Extreme. What does extreme mean? What's the what's the etymology of extreme? In extreme is death, right? Extremist, in extremist, death. But I would allow that here because uh because in terms of its I don't know, I would probably allow that because that I feel I feel like I need to express how complex it is in almost a childlike way using adverbs, um, in terms of reading William Golding. The novel seems to evoke the heart of darkness in every one of us. All great myths do. Uh, the elemental encounter with the cosmos is brought out by the primary mode of narration and ritual enactment, which occurs in the book. Events in their total simplicity and primeval... Just drop my paper. <laughs> primeval freshness um, are simply shown. Shown, show versus tell. And that is why they become endlessly significant. In terms of narration, we find spatialization of events based on symmetry and repetition and the linearity of events seem to be locked in the circularity of its overall structure. The events are stripped of time and become pictures absorbing time and the spatial form converts the human time into mythical time and the child adult is the basic image of the static growth or the fusion of being and becoming in the novel. That is brilliant. That is act, that's brilliant, right? Being and becoming versus being in nothingness, Sartre. Being and becoming signs and symbols um, 
archetypes versus uh, ideograms. And the idea that in the book, there is no time. In fact, there's a, there is a time and there will, and in fact, there will be time for all the days and ways, right? T.S. Eliot. Um, uh, for all the, uh, the taking uh, of toast and tea, he says in the um, love song of jail for proof rock, which we covered. Um, no, in the book, there's only one time I remember where there are two times where they talk about time. <laughs> one is where I think piggy says, what time is it? And the response is who cares? It's basically who gives a shit, right? There's no, who cares? There's no time here. They're just living. They're living in now. Um, and the other is piggy asks, what time is it? Of course, because he's trying to judge by the old world or at least the piggy represents the managerial class of the, he represents the bureaucrat, the bureaucratic managerial soy beta class of the elite in this book. That's why he also has the, he's the innovator and he has technology. He's the, he, he isn't the Promethean figure, but he brings the fire, right? Because his glasses, Piggy's glass, you saw in the thumbnail for this, Piggy's glasses are what allow them to start the fire that w- is supposed to start the signal fire um, that burns out. But then when they restart it, eventually, destroys the entire island, right? Um, and sort of alights their hellscape, yes? Um, but also, the other time that, the other time or instance that time is mentioned is when the speaker, the the anonymous sort of, I'd say he's like, a, he's almost like a Greek mythic chorus, um, says that they, at one point, they gauged when they were going to have a meeting, my nose is really itching, you guys. I'm sorry. It's pollen again. <laughs> um, they they gauged their their time according to when the sun was highest in the sky um, over the island and the castle rock of the island, the mountain, and the sea. Now, also, one thing that um, this critic mentioned in the be- uh, in that little passage right there was the idea of um, spatialization of events based on symmetry and repetition. The book is is repetitive in a number of ways. And that's because for one, on the surface level, the kids on the Island are trying to find a routine. First, they try to first, they, okay. After. So, okay. So what happens is essentially in the book, Ralph is the first one who's shown. Then piggy shows up. Then they go in um, sort of, they sort of penetrate the Island a little bit and they find a lagoon and they go swimming in it. And then they find a shiny object in it, which, which is an apple like, um, uh, object within the pristine uh, tree of knowledge within the um, within the island. There's their Neo Eden. They have to pull it up by the roots, and it, and right after that, it's described as nature sort of darkening, and f- and and then they blow. They find it, the the object they find is a what they call the conch. It's a conch shell, but they call it the conch. They blow on it as a kind of a shofar. They bring all of the. Um, they gather all of the tribes together. They have they establish a hierarchy. Uh, the Luciferian figure of Jack appears because he's described um, as having sort of bright red hair. He's a dark figure. His the people who are with him are wearing literal like dark cloaks. Um, they then they um, they after they've taken the conch and they have their meeting. What happens? Um, they go up, they start a fire, they burn the island, and then they basically lose their clothes and they are N-A-K-E-D and they're ashamed, essentially. Right? And they can't go back. They're guarded. Their Eden is now guarded by a flaming sword in a sense, and they can't go back to where they were. Now, this idea of innocence and experience is repeated throughout kind of in a cycle throughout the rest of the narrative and ends with an ultimate um, specifically stated loss of innocence that Ralph's Ralph says, because now they know what death, they realize what death is, right? They go through a rite of passage that they've, that they've, you know, sort of determined upon themselves and they realize that there is death. Um, there are a number of ritual bloodletting, uh, first blood and bloodletting, um, uh, and ritualistic, specifically re- ritualistic um, uh, dances um, within the within the novel, within the text. Um, there's discovery. There's illumination. 
Um, let's see. Uh, it says, oh, here we go. Um, the child is the basic reduction, including all that is humanly possible, just as the island is the reduction of the universe, but also revelatory of the whole universe. Guys, this is crazy. Like reading this essay is like, it's like it was meant for us in a number of ways. Um, oh, shout out to ADH. Battery dying. Love you. See you later, ADH. Um, in Lodge's terminology, metonymy itself becomes metaphor. On the one hand, there is the linearization of the archetypal human condition. On a, and on the other, history is made to stand still. Um, humanization as a condition and as a progress, the essential illness that seems to be the central vision of the novel. And this is brought out as a discovery of individuation and separateness. Uh, right in the beginning, the human and the cosmic are juxtaposed. The cry of the bird, a vision of red and yellow, which we just read, um, stirred by human intrusion is echoed by another cry. The meaningless cry of the cosmos is juxtaposed with the human cry. Ralph's emergence is seen against the shimmering water. And again, to Ralph's left, the perspectives of palm and beach and water drew to a, a point at infinite. The conch becomes the major sign from now onwards. It becomes a kind of a MacGuffin. But the conch is important in the book because... It's, it's really malleable, right? It's malleable and changeable. It doesn't hold any inherent value. It's just a symbol of whatever they, whatever they want to place into it, right? Um, it says, yeah, it, it says um, for Ralph, it has a communicative function. To Piggy, it has a symbolic function. And to Jack, it has a pragmatic function. In fact, the major conflict of the novel is between the symbolic and utilitarian attitudes, and Ralph is torn between the two. Actually, it's not Ralph who's torn between the two. See, reading this, reading these sorts of analyses, I always find that we can always find that they lead us, they can lead us somewhere and we can hold disparate ideas and values about works of art and works of literature, but we're capable of forming our own opinions based on reason, reason, logic, and fact in terms of what we've read, right? And what I found is that it's not, it's obviously not Ralph who's torn in two. <clears throat> We're made to think that Ralph is torn in two between, between sort of Piggy and Jack, but it's actually not Ralph that's torn in two. It's Simon that's torn in two. Simon is the character. Simon is the visionary character in this book. And you, you kind of, you go into it thinking, okay, who's going to be like the Christ-like figure in this book? Is it going to be Ralph? Cause he's the alpha. It's actually Simon. Um, because why? Well, we think of Simon, right? We think of Simon, um, Simon called Peter. We think of the disciple. He goes into Simon's cave in this. He's a visionary. And the symbol of Simon, right, is what, you guys? I mean, you know this, right? You guys know this. Um, uh, and forgive me if I'm, you know, if I'm getting this incorrect. But the symbol of Simon is the saw, right? It's the saw. Uh, martyred from sawing in two. Sawing and twixt, yes. And Simon is the one who is split in two between, really between the, in the book, between this the spirit, this metaphysical world, and between the temporal world. Um, and that is sort of hard to comprehend in terms of the rest of the structure of the narrative because you're thinking, who is he supposed to, if he's an archetype, who does he represent in this book? Because as we said, Golding goes into a kind of a Christian allegory, but then he, he, he veers away from it. So he's not a total Christ-like figure. He's not a, a total disciple figure. He's also not a complete, like he's not a Gnostic figure per, you know, completely. He's like this, he's something else. And it's hard to get your mind around what what he is and really what he is is he's a combination of a few things he's a visionary and we're going to see we're going to see what it means in terms of the novel and how the three members of this triumvirate react to the same image as we said here and as i mentioned in the beginning we're not talking about archetypes we're actually talking about ideograms we're we're not completely talking about symbols packed Okay, so we're not really talking about uh, the primordial symbols that appeal to, you know, universal human beings. We're talking about sometimes 
we're talking about symbols, weird symbols that stand for themselves and that or that become something new. I'm trying to find a way of explaining this. Um, but the character of Simon in this book really disturbed me. I mean, I, I it's not the character himself, but what what Golding is doing with these characters. It really got to me. I can't explain why it, it was so profound to me, but I think one idea is the profundity of the profundity of their their of the ambiance of their situation, where they are, because they have this imp- impenetrable jungle, but one that they penetrate right from the beginning of the novel, right? We 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 throughout the book where there's this theme of the pen. I'm gonna stop saying that word. <laughs> I just realized, but um we have this idea of like basically knifing through the wilderness because it's it is like pristine and then we have the the boys especially the hunters who sharpen their they sharpen spears and it, it, we have these continuous images of spears like knifing through the 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 foliage um in fact there's the one did we just read it there's the one image of jack um they come upon a flower and um jack like What is Jack does um, Ralph does something with it. He like picks it. Jack pulls out a knife and like knifes the flower and Simon simply sees it. Um, And that to me is like the three levels of in a weird way. I'm trying to decipher what that means in terms of the three layers of the three arc of three sort of archetypal images dealing with this and three layers of what that means for their mic like microcosmic society that on this island right and as i as i said again if you missed it um uh just to like have some continuity my my like hypothesis my i guess my basic hypothesis about this book is that this isn't us we're not it that's one of the the illu- the illusory things about this book is that you're you read this thinking that you are one of these people. Again, I said from the beginning that like the first time I read this, I was in second grade and like, I saw myself in this book, but we don't, we aren't actually in this book. This isn't us. This book is them. This is their playground. This is their, like, this is their experiment. This is their, this is supposed to be symbolic of the way that they run things. Um, it says, it says here at the bottom, the variation in symbolism or meaning creation can be seen in their attitude to the fire also. Um, whereas to one, it is only symbolic of possibility of the retreat to the adult world. Jack wants fire for destructive purposes. And Ralph wants it for purely pragmatic purposes. And both the images of the fire and the conch, both are things and signs, are related to the central image of the beast which also acquires several identities, though basically it seems to be unreal. There's an interesting juxtaposition of the island and the beast by Simon. He says, as if it wasn't a good island. Astonished at the interruption, they look up at Simon's serious face. As if, said Simon, the beastie, the beastie or the snake thing was real. Um, It says, right before that, it said, um, Piggy is not utilitarian. He is a symbolist. Whereas Jack is for aggressive action devoid of significance, but to the visionary Simon, there is no dichotomy between the sign and the significance. And what remains is the pure experience or pure communion. The can- quote, the candle buds open their wide white flowers glimmering under the light that pricked down from the first stars. Their scent spilled out into the air and took possession of the island. To quote Whiteley, Ralph wanted to light the candle buds. Oh, there you go. Ralph wanted to light the candle buds. Jack to cut and eat them, but Simon just sees them. Um, we have the idea of, oh, 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 yeah. One of the major themes in this is the persona, right? The mask and how um, Ra- uh, Jack's degeneration is linked with his mask, which signifies a separateness from his, this true being and a kinship with the beast. So what they do is, <coughs> what happens is um, they discover that one of the kids basically the night before says that he heard things in the wilderness and that there's a beastie out there, he says. Um, And they start to think it's like a demon. And 
um, Jack is like, no, no, there's no such thing. Right. And basically, you know, they're, they're all, they all have their different ideas about this, but what we find out later on is that the beastie is actually a man. Um, and the man is probably the pilot of the, of the plane on which they flew. Uh, it mentions that they were in, it says they were in Gibraltar and then in, uh, Addis, uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, what is it, you guys? No, I can't speak. Um, uh, what's the name of the city? Addis Ababa. <laughs> oh boy, I sound like a slow boy right now. Um, where is it? Is it Kenya? Um, wow, you guys, forgive me. Look, I'm just a country boy, okay? I'm here in Appalachistan and I'm trying to talk about some damn place called Addis Ababa or some, some damn thing. Gibraltar, I don't know where that is. Go, thank you. It's in Ethiopia, right somewhere. You know, we got Gibraltar right there on the coast of Spain, still English. I don't know, folks. I'm just trying to trying to do the best I can here with my CoQ10. All right. So, um, but they've come from this place, and then they the parachutist, the man who's parachuted down, who's now in Simon's cave, has been groaning and making noises. And then what they discover, they don't discover him till later. Simon is the one who crawls through the wilderness and find um, this, this character who represents their old world. But in our archetype, what we just discovered, it probably represents um, either a overseer, an overwatcher, right? Or the commander himself of their little um, monarch operation that they have going here, right? Their child super soldier, Kathy O'Brien uh, monarch operation. The most dangerous game. Right. Again, we just mentioned this. I think it was in the uh, DPH stream, right? How one of the tropes, I, I, this is for my, my impression is that the, um, the, the most dangerous game is one of the new, one of the new con like continuous tropes of especially films that's here. Think how many movies in the past, like five years have been the most dangerous game. And that obviously was revelatory and predictive of where we are now and of the, uh, multiple agendas on which we, we find ourselves, but this is just another one. Although it's 1954 and this is a cold war book written with a, a, a nuclear H O L O cost in, in the back of the, of the novel looming large. And we don't even know if these boys are imagining it. We don't know if piggy is a reliable narrator narrator but a reliable character we don't know because of their age we don't know because the rest of the island seems like a dream like a, dr a dream state and in fact <laughs> we don't know at the end of the book we don't know if at the end of the book if um oh did we pop out for uh did, did we almost go out for a second there okay all right good i think we should be good now yeah we should be good there's not really anything i can do about it i mean i we do the best we can um but you know, Gil Bates attacks them. Damn, you know, he dry, he ionizes that stuff and, and drops the, you know, listen, magnetic power lines, uh, and, and, and chemtrail, uh, T R A I L S over the country club. Right. Shout out to ghost reptile out there on Instagram. Shout out to ghost reptile. Um, because Gil Bates and those ions be messing with us. Um, okay. So back to this, uh, let's see. Uh, the let's see symbolically this may well be the central sign of the book oh oh sorry i didn't finish that little train of thought um they kill a pig okay they find that there are wild pigs on the island just like aj on the um on the trail or outside of austin there are wild pigs and jack actually catches one but before he can you know draw first blood with his with this knife that he has um it gets away. Now that it's a, it's actually a, a piglet. It's a, it's a child pig, which mirrors that their situation, right? We, the idea of mirroring is huge in this book because number one, they're on an Island surrounded by a giant mirror, right? It's the, the sea, the sea is continuously described as a, you know, there's the, as an infinite point in the distance where the sky and the sea sort of blend into one. Um, we have, Piggy's glasses are a mirror and the, you know, when we've continuously mentioned the, the, um, the psychic 
fracturing DID break occurring with mirrors. And that occurs literally in the story, right? The, the glasses and then the glasses become a power symbol, just like the conch, but they're utilitarian and they get, they get fractured and the fracturing also mirrors the way the pattern, the pattern described on the glasses of the, uh, the, the fracture pattern on the glasses, the way it's described mirrors the distance in a panorama arising from right, you've got like black trails of smoke, which mirror cracks in the black, uh, the black cracks in the, in the glass, in piggy's glasses, if that makes sense. Um, we have characters disassociating we because Simon is an epileptic. He's almost a uh, he's almost a cesarean uh, epileptic, which again, right the the triumvirate motif in the um, in the novel is mirrored in the triumvirate that's established in their hierarchy. Simon is one of these, and he ends up in a way. So in a way he ends up being the Caesar character because he's epileptic and he's powerful. And then he is, he is assassinated in front of all the other guys. And he's literally stabbed in the back, just like in a Caesar ritual. We covered Julius Caesar um, at, here at the channel. We covered uh, Caesar's uh, death and, the, and uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And he falls into an epileptic visionary fit. Um, a, a couple of times within the book, especially when he comes across the beast. And there is a really disturbing passage um, in this novel, which I had not, I did not recall it until this rereading. And it really got to me. Um, so we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. Okay. So it says, here is a clear contrast between the beast hunting of Jack and the recognition of Simon. In one case, the collective action is itself an expression of ego. Okay. Um, in other, in the other, the individual identifies himself with all the beasts. The ritualistic death of Simon imparts meaning to the other ritual. In Jack, action robbed the ritual itself of significance, which is restored by Simon by total identification with others. Um, we have, yeah, the death of Piggy and the fracturing of the mirror. Um, they're through right there through the looking glass. Um, shouts out to uh, base home school mom. Rachel Wilson and Andrew Wilson, BPF over at the crucible and shouts out to Jerry because we did um, a through the looking glass episode um, over, over at that channel. Um, it says, let us contrast this sea burial with the unceremonial ceremonial death of piggy. Um, so they, they finally found the pig and the pig that they find is obviously mirrored in piggy, the character. And, the pig, they end up sticking the pig. They stab the pig in the back, just like Caesar is stabbed in the back, just like um, Simon is stabbed in the back. And then Jack cuts off, he decapitates the pig. They put it on a stick. They put it in the wilderness. And it represents um, kind of a, uh, it's a, it's an obvious sign, but the pig and the, the, this is the, this is Beel, this is the sign of Beelzebub, right? This is the, this is the Lord of the Flies because the, the dead pig's head, attracts the flies and Beelzebub is like, so Beelzebub is like, first of all, one of the names of Satan and is also one of the um, nine princes of hell and, and is the sort of demon of gluttony, right? Now, how does gluttony play into this novel? Well, they're continuously hungry, For first of all. Um, they're on a desert island and they're boys and we have them, you know, they're eating the fruit of the island and then they eat the pig. But they are hungry on a in a deeper sense because their hunger is like a Blakeian hunger for experience once they cross over from innocence. And it's almost like, a, in a way, it's an almost vampirical hunger. You, you, you guys ever seen that movie, The Hunger, um, from the early 80s? It has David Bowie in it, doesn't it? It's a vampire movie. Uh, I think it's got David Bowie. Um, David Bowie. David Bowie, forgive me. I'm oh, sorry, David Bowie. It's got David Bowie in it. And um, the hunger also, it reminds me of, this is related but unrelated, but 
Uh, there's this musician I like, Bat for Lashes, Natasha Khan. I mentioned her on Instagram Live one time. And she's got this album um, where it's basically about these, like, it came out just a few years ago. It's a great, like, synth pop album, sort of electro pop. And it it's, like, about, like, L.A. girl vampires. Um, and one of the songs is called The Hunger. And it's got a saxophone solo in it, just like, remember sex, Sexy Sax Man from from Lost Boys. Shouts out to, to Jay's analysis, right? Um, and uh, it reminded me of that. The, the tone of that song reminds me of the hunger in this because they are always, they're hungry for blood. There's continuous mentions, uh, there's a continuous mention of blood within the narrative. The word, the words that appear most in the, in this work are blood and creeper. Um, now, I'm not saying that that has anything to do with this. Although obviously we know what we haven't mentioned yet is the idea of like who the main characters are and are they being watched? Right. And it's interesting that the creeper is the, you know, it's a vine. It's, it's remember in, like we said in, um, in the thin red line, right. Nick Nolte, um, nature's cruel Starls. See how those vines twist around everything, killing everything. It's cruel Starls, Right. And the creeper is continuously described because nature is sw is swallowing them up. But, and the way that they creep through the wilderness, the way that they form these, what they call pig runs, um, right? They form basically like scars in nature so that they can trap the pig as it's running and then stab it. Yes. And kill it. But, um, but the creeper, yes. Um, let's see. And then at the end of this particular essay, Shouts out to DPH again, David Patrick Harry, our homeboy, our big time homeboy, Church of the Eternal Logos, who again, one more time, boosted us big time, right? Um, DPH, who who um, gave us that interview, um, let us be on his channel the other day, which we really appreciate. I I really appreciate that uh, personally, and um, but we're all sort of taking part in this, right? And um, and you guys, we're all. You know, we're lifting each other up here um, versus the Orwellian, you know, the Orwellian, um, wh what they do in that sense, right? At the end of that novel. Um, and shouts out to DPH because it says here at the end, uh, the sea is the final symbol parallel to the shell. And this also manifests various emotions from wonder to acceptance. The heavenward movement is also the homeward movement. And after participating in the silence of the angry forest and the endless pursuit of the other, Ralph stumbled on a route, the reality, here we go. All the time, the novel seems to be saying that it is all a fictitious world with deliberate references to other fictions and other children. But all the all the time, it also seems to suggest that it is nothing but reality. But all um, was it a vision or a dream? Is it fiction or reality? Is this the fundamental epistemological question of life that finds its aesthetic realization, if not real resolution, in Lord of the Flies? Lord of the Flies does not mean, in piggy sense, it is becomes the word capital W or sign is the significance right shouts out to DPH Church of the Eternal Logos shouts out to JD J Dyer because this critic right here just used that analysis okay which which they have covered in their extremely high Q analyses of various works um, for years so I thought that was amazing to come across in a random work of analysis. Now I'm just going to go back to the book and cover some of the passages here. Um, let's see. Um, so we talked about how Eden, they're sort of neo, sort of neo um, post-apocalyptic, post-depop um, world has been, you know, there has been their world it was annihilated and now they are dropped onto this island where they are starting their new Eden. And it says, and they've already violated it. And then here we go. Smoke was rising here and there. This is page 44 among the creepers that festooned the dead or dying trees. As they watched, a flash of fire appeared at the root of one wisp and then the smoke thickened. Small flames stirred at the trunk of a tree and crawled away through leaves and brushwood, dividing and increases the tree the tree here, there's a central tree, which is, you know, you think of the tree of 
the obvious tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of which they have stolen. Acres of black and yellow smoke, they burn it. Um, rolled steadily toward the sea. At the sight of the flames and the irresistible course of the fire, the boys broke into a shrill, excited cheering. The flames, as enough, uh, as though they were a kind of wildlife, crept as a jaguar creeps on its belly toward a line of birch-like saplings that fledged an outcrop of, uh, outcrop of the pink rock. They looked at him with eyes that lacked interest in what they saw and cocked ears at the drum roll of the fire. Piggy glanced nervously into hell and cradled the conch. Um, how can you expect to be rescued if you don't put first things first and act proper? Ordo ab caio, right? And then we have that one of the boys had a vision um, he ended up, one of the boys had a vision of the beast. He then, it says the little one that had a mark on his face. Where is he now? I tell you, I don't see him. Perhaps he went back to the, beneath him on the unfriendly side of the mountain. The drum roll continued and the first child is sacrificed to the flames. Right. Their Oracle is dead. Um, and but um, a lot of the many, there's a lot, there's a lot that's influential. I mean, chapter two is called fire on the mountain, right? Shouts out to grateful dead. Um, uh, and then we have, if you didn't know, um, Stefan creeper King, right. And castle rock. And then castle later castle rock entertainment comes from this book. Does Simon names the one of the castle rock. Uh, let's see. Chapter three, we get full on monarch mode here. Um, let's see. Uh, the tree trunks and the creepers that festooned them lost themselves in a green dust 30 feet above him. And all about was the undergrowth. Here was a loop of creeper with a tendril pendant for a node. Jack crouched with his, okay, here we go. Jack crouched with his face a few inches from this clue and then stared forward into the semi-darkness of the undergrowth. His sandy hair considerably longer than it had been when they dropped in was lighter now and his bare back was a mass of dark freckles and peeling sunburn. Um, the surge of blood, there was a surge of blood again. He passed like shadow under the darkness of the tree and crouched looking down at the trodden ground at his feet, staring into the abyss. Stare. Yeah. Jeff, don't get that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes. Um, let's see. Jack stood there streaming with sweat streaks with brown earth stained by all the vicissitudes of a day's hunt and swearing. He turned off the trail and pushed his way through until the forest opened a little. And instead of bald trunks supporting a dark roof, there were light trunks and crowns of feathery palm. Um, there's a, uh, there was, I mean, this is like exactly what this is like most dangerous game monarch, um, descriptive behavior here. And we also have the waste went the wasteland again. I did that. the wasteland. We have the wasteland here. We have the way. Hello, hello, you guys. We're studying the wasteland here. This is the wasteland from T.S. Eliot. Hello, water there by the tree ought to be some left. Um, the what we have the Eden right running with the water of life. Um, and T.S. Eliot's wasteland right with the water under the rock. Two shot. Let's see. Um. Piggy uh, tries to introduce this like parliamentary uh, democratic system of meetings, right? In his managerial class bureau bureaucratic mode. Um, and they, they, they maintain those throughout, but just like in reality, they are an illusion, right? Even the power within their own system overrides that. Um, and they are, continuously compelled and drawn by the power in the darkness of Beelzebub. And we haven't really mentioned much about that aspect of the book. So let me find, um, uh, let's see a couple passages here. Uh, okay. Page 56. Let's see. Um, Simon turned away from them and went, went where the just perceptible path led him. He takes the, at this point, does he take the left-hand path right through the through the um, through the wilderness and find he's? It says 
The creepers dropped their ropes. Um, his feet left prints in the soft, and the creepers shivered throughout their lengths. When he bumped them, he came to a place where more sunshine fell, so he, he walks into illuminate confirmed illumination. And then, let's see, so, and then he comes across Beelzebub. Simon paused. He looked over his shoulder as Jack had done at the close ways behind him and glanced swiftly around to confirm that he was utterly alone. Then he bent down his wor and wormed his way into the center of the mat. Wormed because the worms of degeneration, degradation, and death, and the ones that are going to eat at the pig's head. Um, nothing moved but a pair of gaudy butterflies, Monarch confirmed. Uh, that co that continuously occurs throughout the book. The deep sea breaking miles away on the reef made an undertone less perceptible than the um, susurration of the blood. Susurration is like a, a, a whispering, a whispering or a murmuring. When the while the fading of the light and the riotous colors died and the heat and the urgency cooled away, darkness poured out. Their scent spilled out into the air and took possession of the island. It's a demonic pouring out of the possession of the island from the um, from the darkness. Uh, let's see the page sixty four. We get the mask. The mask um, plays a huge role in this. In the themes of this book, we get the the idea of the mask and the the archetypal mask, right? Um, uh, the killer woke up on. He put his boots on. He took his uh, took he took his he took a face from the ancient gallery and he walked on down the hall, right? He took a face from the ancient gallery and he walked on down the hall. He's putting on his persona. Of course, when we talk about masks, we talk about the archetypal Greek. Uh, tragic and comedic masks that were used as part of Bacchanal and Bacchic rituals so that entertainment, art, literature, and religion all melded into one in the ancient Greek pagan system. And putting on the mask of, putting, putting on the mask of disguise and of a new identity. And Jack does that in the book by painting his face continuously with blood. What blood? The blood of the Beelzebub pig and the violation of their Eden. Also, they continuously, um, well, uh, KIDS are being murdered throughout this, and it's interesting how they turn a blind eye to it every time. Part of that is because they are still living in a system of Blakey and, you know, a, a state of innocence, a state of innocence in nature where they don't understand or comprehend death, even when it occurs. Their own hands, they start to understand um, the climax, the pinnacle of their pyramid system in the novel. Um, also, continuous references to mazes. Mazes and um, and mazes, dreams, mind states. Uh, Ralph discovered, with a convulsion of the mind, Ralph discovered dirt and decay. Understood how much he disliked perpetually flicking the tangled hair out of his eyes. Um, here we go with the triangle. The place of, he discovered dirt and decay is just a surface level literal statement, meaning he's always dirty. Right? That's what I got in second grade. But now I read this as a grown-ass man, and I go, he understood death and decay and dirt. The place of assembly in which he stood was roughly a triangle, but irregular and sketchy, like everything they, ma like everything they made. Grass was worn away in front of each trunk, but grew tall and untrodden at the center of the triangle. Then at the apex, the grass was thick again because no one sat there. Right? The separated cap of the pyramid. Ralph turned to the chief's seat, um, turned to it. Again, he fell into that strange mood of speculation that was so foreign to him. If faces were different when lit from above or below, what was a face? What was anything? Is a little passage thrown into page 78. Think of that. What, right? What does that even mean? Well, let's talk about what it means. 
Again, he fell into the strange mood of speculation that was so foreign to him in his leadership position, foreign to him here, foreign there away from home, foreign, foreign because um, they've been through those foreign places, foreign because they're in a strange new land, foreign they're in a new eon, in a new world, new aeon, excuse me. If faces were different from lit, if faces were different when lit from above or below, we come on people, right? What was a face? What was anything? Um, let's see. Let's move on to um, Simon's vision. Simon thought of the beast. There rose before his inward sight the picture of a human at once heroic and sick. Simon's vision, again, is that the sign and the symbol are the same thing. He sees that the sickness, the kind of Sophoclean um, Oedipal sickness that inhabits their, their, their Theban wilderness here is a sickness of, them, of themselves, in a sense, or it's a sickness of the world which they are inheriting, or it's a sickness of the world which they're going to go on at the end of the novel to inherit. Golding, one of the things Golding said about this was that himself, one of the things he said was that essentially um, the irony of the book is that, you know, they, they're they like delivered to this island at the beginning and they have a chance to like start this new world. But the world they're in, they're, they are inheriting is a world they're inheriting because of the annihilation of the old world. But at the end, what happens and what happens at the end of the book is the world, basically, um, there's a power struggle. Ralph uh, um, Ralph and Piggy are like alone finally in their camp. And Jack's Luciferian camp comes and and Ralph fights back. He, he beats up a bunch of the kids, but they come for one purpose. And that is to steal um, the mirror image of industry and illumination, the glasses and they from piggy and they get them. And then, so then the, the hunters and Jack can make fire. Right. And then what happens is Ralph and piggy go and they, they confront the other camp. And when they get there, um, they Jack and Ralph uh, fight Ralph. It's kind of a draw, but Ralph pretty much wins. And then Roger, who is really like a Mephistopheles figure, um, drops a rock from above, right? Drops a rock from above onto Piggy and Piggy falls 40 feet and he smashes on the his body and his head smash on the rocks below. And his they they describe Piggy's brains, but in a in in the mode of still not understanding, pink stuff comes out of his head, right? Piggy, pig. Um, the pink pig and the, and his skull splits open. And then immediately the, the waves come and the ocean swallows him up and he's gone into the abyss. He's gone into the abyss and he's gone back into the mirror of the ocean and he's disappeared into the infinite point on the horizon. And he's disappeared into the wilderness from which they came, right? They came from this place. And then the island sets on, they set the island on fire and they hunt for, ja, uh, for Ra, uh, what's his name? Ralph. They hunt for Ralph. Ralph is alone. He's the lone survivor in terms of the their old system. He's the old alpha. And he's barely, he's, you know he's going to die. He's going to be engulfed in flames in a H-O-L-O-C-A-U-S-T. And then ritualistically uh, Caesarean stabbed and probably stuck on a pike uh, like the pig was at the beginning, the first one that they kill, except for he, he comes out of the wilderness into the open and there's a man standing there. And the man is a Royal Naval officer. And the guy's response is ridiculous. And that is adds an absurd element to the story because you're wondering, were these kids placed there and now they're gaslighting him? Was this a, mo a most dangerous game thing? Was it all a dream? 
because he says, Oi, you know, look at the, the little kids. You know, they're all, they're playing games. Did you all make it? And Ralph says, well, t- you know, two of us didn't make it or some of us haven't made it. And then the guy says, oh, well, oh, well, the island is on fire. The world is on fire. They're burning their Eden. They're burning their paradise. They're dead. There's There have been ritual murders and and sacrifices. There's horrible destruction of innocence. There's an absolute conflagration. And this guy says, oh, well, and then they're airlifted and they go back up into the sky. It's absurd. It's so disturbing. It it really pisses me off. It doesn't piss me off that, that it ends this way. It pisses me off. Yes, Thomas Henderson, banished from Eden by the flame. And again, the idea of the... Um, of repetition that occurs a, a few times in the book. It's not just once. They're banished from their from Eden. Then they're then they then there's more flames. Then the island flame, and then finally it is totally engulfed in flames, and they are literally banished, and they go back away, back into the world. And is this their new start? Is this their the regeneration and the new aeon? Um, Simon. By the way, what happens? We talked about how Simon is ritualistically sacrificed on the beach, right? He's he's murdered, assassinated. But there's this. There are a couple of parts with Simon that are so bizarre. Page uh, one eleven. Um, the filthy enchantments of Mirage uh, one ten could not endure the cold open uh, ocean water, and the horizon was hard, clipped blue, wave after wave. Ralph followed the rise and fall until something of the remoteness of the sea numbed his brain. Then gradually the almost infinite size of this water forced itself on his attention. This was the divider. This, the barrier on the other side of the Island, page 111, swathed at midday with mirage defended by the shield of the quiet lagoon. One might dream of rescue, but here faced by the brute obtuseness of the ocean, the miles of division, one was clamped down. One was helpless. One was condemned. One was, Simon was speaking almost in his ear. That's Simon speaking. Simon was speaking all of that. This is no, this is, this ain't no kid's book, you guys. Simon is speaking in the voice of, of an oracle, right? He's all, he's speaking in the voice of a, of an otherworldly figure. Is he speaking in the voice of a, you know, who is he in this? Right? Is he some kind of like Gnostic demigod? Is he a, is he or is he speaking in the archetype of a saint? Um, Ralph found that he had a rock painfully gripped in both hands. Found his body arched in the muscles of his stiff neck. His mouth strained open. Ralph's about to kill somebody. Simon says, "You'll get back to where you came from. You'll get back to where you you came from." Simon says. He doesn't say we'll get back to where we came from. He says. You will get back to where you came from. Is he Simon the Magus, right? Um, Simon nodded as he spoke. He was kneeling on one knee, looking down from a higher rock, which he held with both hands, his other leg stretched down to Ralph's level. Ralph was puzzled and searched Simon's face for a clue. It's so big. I mean, Ralph nodded. All the same, you'll get back all right. I think so anyway. This is like, this is crazy. Um, let's look at the scene where Simon talks to Beelzebub because this scene fucking blew my mind. Excuse my language, folks. Uh, before we get to that on page 140, the forest was near them burst. The forest near them burst into uproar. The forest near them burst into uproar. Demoniac figures with faces of white and red and green rushed out howling so that the little ones fled screaming. Out of the corner of his eyes, Ralph saw Piggy running. Two figures rushed at the fire, and he prepared to defend himself, but they grabbed half-burnt branches and raced away along the beach. The three others stood still, watching Ralph, and he saw that the tallest of them, stark naked, save for the paint and a belt, was Jack. And then it says, here we go, page 143. This is this really got to me because, you know, I, j- I just remembered this, right? Page 143. You're a silly little boy, said the Lord of the Flies. Just an ignorant, silly little boy. 
Simon moved his swollen tongue, but said nothing. Don't you agree, said the Lord of the Flies? Aren't you just a silly little boy? Simon answered him in the same silent voice. Well then, said the Lord of the Flies, you'd better run off and play with the others. They think you're batty. You don't want Ralph to think you're batty, do you? You like Ralph a lot, don't you? And Piggy and Jack. Simon's head was tilted slightly up. His eyes could not break away and the Lord of the Flies hung in space before him. What are you doing out here all alone? Aren't you afraid of me? Simon shook. There isn't anyone to help you, only me, and I'm the beast. Simon's mouth labored, brought forth audible words, pig's head on a stick. Fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill, said the head. For a moment or two, the forest and all the other dimly appreciated places echoed with the parody of laughter. You knew, didn't you? I'm part of you. Close, close, close. I'm the reason why it's no go, why things are what they are. The laughter shivered again. Come now, said Lord of the Flies. Get back to the others and we'll forget the whole thing. Simon's head wobbled. His head, his eyes were half closed as though he were imitating the obscene thing on the stick. He knew that one of his times was coming on. He's epileptic. He's in a seizure. The Lord of the Flies was expanding like a balloon. This is ridiculous. You know perfectly well you'll only meet me down there. So don't try to escape. Simon's body was arched and stiff. The Lord of the Flies spoke in the voice of a schoolmaster. This has gone quite far enough. My poor misguided child, do you think you know better than I do? There was a pause. I'm warning you. I'm going to get angry. Do you see? You're not wanted. Understand? We're going to have fun on this island. Understand? We're going to have fun on this island. So don't try it on, my poor misguided boy, or else. Simon found he was looking into a vast mouth. There was a blackness within, a blackness that spread. Or else, said the Lord of the Flies, we shall do, we shall do you. See, Jack and Roger and Maurice and Robert and Bill and Piggy and Ralph, do you? See, Simon was inside the mouth. He fell down and lost consciousness. That, that uh, really, really gets to me. Um, That scene really, really gets to me. I mean, that, that's, that's pure, that's, that's demonic. Uh, that's fucked up. That's demonic. It's so bad. It's so bad. Fuck this guy, man. Fuck you, Beelzebub. Fuck you, Beelzebub. Fuck all your people. Fuck you. Um, so... That scene really gets to me um, because, excuse my language, really, I'm serious, excuse me. Um, that scene really gets to me because I feel like, um, like I walk, like I walked into like some secret. You know what I'm saying? Because I read this book, I've read this book so many times, and I don't know how I don't remember that scene. Right? I don't remember how I don't remember that scene, and I and I. To think that, like, I read this in second grade, right? It makes me sick. It makes me sick. This is pure, this is pure degradation. This is pure, um, the book's not just called Lord of the Flies. It's not just a figurative thing. It's not just a background image. Uh, their island, their Eden is a, they violate it and Satan rules their little world. And Simon confront Simon seizes and dissociates and envisions this. And he is, when he sees the mouth, when he sees this pig's head on a stick, then he, he hears this voice and he's going into the mouth of the pig. And then he goes into the hell mouth. Right. Well, you know what? Um, and I'm not, I'm not mad, obviously that, that William Golding wrote this. It's not, it's not him, right? He is writing something that is true here in terms of their, the world within this and their system. And what people don't understand when they read this book is that, 
this is what they want. This is what they want on their new island, on their new island, on their new Aeon. They want a world where they can do all this fucked up shit, where they can kill and turn a blind eye, where they can be delivered back in their plane, back to their world, or, or, or inflict that upon us on the other side of that mirror ocean, right? When they cross over that abyss. They want this world. They want, they have their own little power struggles, but they don't even mind killing. They don't even mind getting rid of each other because they're being watched and played on and inhabited by uh, Beelzebub at the peak of their little fucking pyramid. Right. That's what they want. Well, guess what? I hate the Antichrist. And I love God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, and this this shit makes me sick, man. It makes me sick. I was really, um, I'm sorry for going on about this, folks, but it makes me. I mean, this book really disturbed me. Um, let's. I'll, I'll move on here. Let's get to the end of the book. Um, let me get to the very last page here because this part really, really got to me. Um, it's page two hundred two, very end of the book. You're all British, aren't you? Would have been able to put up a better show than I, than that. I mean, it was like that at first, said Ralph, before things, he stopped. We were together then. The officer nodded helpfully. I know, jolly good show, like the Coral Island. Ralph looked at him dumbly. Right, right. Ralph looked at him dumbly like, um, like uh, Mark Antony's funeral oration talking about the, Caesar's wounds prophesying like dumb mouths, right? Um, for a moment, he had a fleeting picture of the strange glamour that had once invested the beaches, but the, uh, the glamour, but the island was searched, was scorched up like dead wood. Simon was dead and Jack had, the tears began to flow and sobs shook him. He gave himself up to them now for the first time on the island, great shuddering spasms of grief that seemed to wrench his whole body. His voice rose under the black smoke before the burning wreckage of the island. And infected by that emotion, the other little boys began to shake and sob too. And in the middle of them, with filthy body, matted hair, and unwiped nose, Ralph wept for the end of innocence. The darkness of man's heart and the fall through the air of the wise true friend, true wise friend called Piggy. The officer surrounded by these noises was moved and a little embarrassed. He turned away to give them time to pull themselves together and waited, allowing his eyes to rest on the trim cruiser in the distance. Ralph wept for the end of innocence. Mm. That's it. That is uh, a heavy, heavy book. And you guys... I did not intend when I went back to this book, I didn't intend to, I didn't, you, that's the thing. Okay. So that's one good thing is here. <laughs> one good thing is um, going back to these works, going back to the source material, going back to the text, we keep discovering, right? That things aren't what they seem or what we remember. And we go back to the text and they have, they can have a profound effect on us. And the words are, uh, we're true. We're not, remember, we're not like taking a, um, an Aesop moral from this. We're not like, um, figuring out a mystery here. We're looking at, we're analyzing, we're explicating literature for a worldview. And, um, it's a bummer, dude. It, it's a bummer. That's right. Crispy. It's a bummer. It's a bummer. This book is a bummer. This book is a bummer more than, 1984 is a bummer to me. Okay. It's way more of a bummer. And I think that if you went back, people that if you went back and you read this book and you're not affected by this book on a visceral level, um, yeah, maybe you can read it dispassionately and um, objectively, but if you're not affected um, by this book on a visceral uh, and religious level, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just too sensitive. Um, but, but this book really affected me, man. It really, it really affected me. Um, and, 
And I think that, um, you know, I think it's a good window um, into, into um, a system and a worldview. So phone's ringing, dude. Phone's ringing. Hey, man, this is a private residence, man. I love it because that scene in the film, he's in the bath listening to Songs of the Whale. Big Lebowski, if you don't know, if you're watching this later. Um, he's listening to Songs of the Whale, and he says, far out, man, far out. And then somebody breaks in the door, and his response is that it's a private residence. <laughs> we stomp with this. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, series, dude. <laughs> so, listen. Um, yes. Thank you again, you guys, uh, for being here with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing this time with me. And hopefully, you know, hopefully, hopefully this isn't, um, hopefully this isn't, you know, a total black pill. This is like, this is, um, you know, we have, um, salvation and deliverance and we're reading a, a text, right? So thank you so much, um, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks to all the homies, uh, for being here. Thanks again to our, our homies, um, DPH Kotel and to JD. Thanks to JD, right? Thanks to Jay Dyer over at um, his channel and at Jay's analysis, who uh, bo also boosted the stream a ton just by sharing it in the community tab and just um, on his YouTube and um, on um, on various on various platforms um, that really boosted us. So we really appreciate it. All right, let's check and see if we have any um, if we chats. Right? Yo, shouts. Based mom, let's go. Shouts out to Rachel Wilson, based mom. Please buy her book, Occult Feminism. Buy her book. Check out her work. Check out her written work. Check out her work and her debates at the Crucible. Check out, just check her out because she is a great. We are blessed to know her. Um, you know, verified e celeb. We know Rachel Wilson, of course, from Exposing Powerful Lies live streams. And from that other thing, that Tucker Carlson show. Um, but yeah, we're blessed to know her. And she said, she donated 10 bucks and said, for educating my simple ass. Well, guess what? Uh, you are not simple. Um, listen. Uh, you have the fire of human dignity. Right? You are complex and beautiful and we love you. You are a light. So... Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate you, of course. You are a huge support. You are a great friend, and uh, we love you so much. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Um, wow. Thomas Henderson donates 10 bucks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thomas Henderson, for donating 10 bucks. I really appreciate you, homeboy. Uh, we love you. You're always so supportive here, and you really um, – uh, keep us going, and you are a true Kang and a good homie, and we love you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Thomas, if you said anything, I can't see it right here. So if you did drop a message, please forgive me for not being able to see it. Um, and of course, you guys, shout out to our homeboy Nick at TGF, the Green Feathers. Check out his channel. Um, you are uh, a true Kang, a true homeboy, a true friend. And we really appreciate you. Thank you for your amazing $150 donation. You are awesome. And again, uh, I'm so thankful to you and to all of our homies um, for supporting me. It really means a lot. Hits me right. Hits me right in the heart. Hits me right in the feels, you guys. Seriously, I really appreciate you. And I love you. Thank you so much. Um, shouts out to everybody who has supported, everybody who has um, liked the video, like and share, right? Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of traction and we're, we're going to keep going up, you guys. I'm going to keep doing keep doing these. And, um, you know, I'm having fun. And, you know, I think we got a, a good thing going here and we're going to keep going. We're going to keep rising, um, hopefully. Um, and, you know, we're going to keep having fun. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can get our friend Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies, who is now at 10,000 plus views on his channel. He is an actual alpha level e-celeb. He has leveled up. He's leveled up like AJ, right? In the ah, ah, flames. 
meme. So we're going <laughs> to, we are going to uh, demand of Jerry that he do a, uh, Chad nerd, uh, star seed, indigo child, star seed, um, uh, Chad nerd party stream soon. We want that. We want that stat homeboy. Okay. And, uh, and he is at a, t he's got a ton of views. He's got a ton of subs and he is our homeboy. So we thank you. Yes. He, no, you, you are officially an alpha level East lab, uh, at least to me, brother. Okay. Um, and so anyway, you guys, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And, um, I hope everybody has a, a, a blessed weekend and, um, I will see you soon, you guys. Okay. Have a good night. Peace. I love y'all. Peace.